When the war in Ukraine began, there were estimates that Russia would establish air superiority within a matter of days. But nine months into the war, the skies over Ukraine are still contested. Russia's air force should have been one of their biggest strengths. So why have they struggled to utilize their air power effectively? And how has the war in the air changed as a result? The air war, uh, the Russian air war, really wasn't what many would have anticipated, uh, especially if you look at previous examples of Ukraine, Syria, and even Chechnya. Many point to the fact that it really didn't destroy that many Ukrainian aircraft on the ground, that it didn't crater too many runways, that it didn't hit, you know, regular things like bridges and so on that we would have expected. In fact, that it, it was a very inefficient use of air power. The, the other issue is, is that it really shows something of a, of a poverty within Russian air power itself in that what we ordinarily understand as kind of combined arms mm -hmm. is something where you have a lot of technology behind, you know, a few aircraft to really maximize some kind of effect. What we see in the case of the Russians that they do have some fantastic aircraft. There's a feeling that actually that there's not all of this kind of uh, infrastructure and people behind it, and, and that includes logistics. The vast geographical size of Ukraine provides another stumbling block for strikes, and this is made more difficult by what appears to be years of corruption damaging their air force. What we see in particular is a great deal of mismanagement, kleptocracy, um, you know, uh, favored projects over some kind of strategic effect. There's even a, a deeper problem. Uh, for, for the Russians other than just equipment or, or just, say, manpower. And then we can see this, this problem impacting all across uh, the Russian military, from ground forces to air forces, that the level of corruption in, in Russia itself has had an impact on its ability to have a tactical or, or even strategic effect. Without support from the air, Russia's ground forces have been largely unable to mount effective combined arms operations, which has led to heavy losses. But the key reason for Russia's inability to effectively use its air force has been its failure to take out Ukraine's mobile surface-to-air missile systems. They have been unable to suppress enemy air defenses. Early on, Ukraine prioritized reinforcing their ground-based air defenses with repeated requests for allies for more air defense systems. And a lot of the systems that we've seen on both sides in the war date back to the Soviet era. Since the early days of the Cold War, the Soviet Union was prolific in the development and production of ground-based surface-to-air missiles. Guided surface-to-air missiles were under development when the Second World War ended, but saw rapid development in the 50s and 60s, particularly in the US, Great Britain, France and the Soviet Union. The SA-2 guideline, or S-75 Divina, was introduced in 1958 and became the first surface-to-air guided missile system used in combat and the most widely deployed surface-to-air missile in the world. Used effectively in the Vietnam War, this was one of the first times in which guided anti-aircraft missiles seriously challenged advanced supersonic jet aircraft. By the 1960s, the development and deployment of surface-to-air missiles began to entirely change the nature of air wars and air forces. New aircraft were developed, ones that could fly lower and evade the missile's radar performance and mobility of surface-to-air missiles continue to increase. The S-300 missile systems offered ranges of around 150 kilometers, along with good mobility. The most significant uh, that we saw earlier were these uh, S-300s, and in, in some cases I believe S-400s. That means that attack aircraft that, that would be launched from Russia. In order for them to avoid these systems, they have to actually fly very low to the ground. And we've seen many uh, instances on social media of these aircraft just, uh, you know, a thousand or so feet above the ground streaming along the uh, Ukrainian countryside. And the, the problem is, is, of course, is as soon as they start doing that, they become really targets for other systems. As surface-to-air missile technology advanced, the mobility and maneuverability of these missiles was increasingly seen as the priority, making them harder to hit. The Soviet Union's 9K-33 OSA was the first system to include search, track and missiles all on a single mobile platform. Another game-changer increasingly influential in the last three decades are man-portable air defense systems, or MANPADS. 
the 9K32 Strela-2 was the first Soviet man-portable surface-to-air missile, entering service in 1968. The Strela-2 was an infrared guided missile with a seeker in the nose. The weapon was produced in large quantities and distributed worldwide. This Strela-2 in IWM's collection was captured by British forces during Operation Desert Storm and is missing its grip stock. In the early days of use of, say, shoulder-mounted missiles in something like bazookas of our, our RPGs, and that they were used largely with an idea that you kind of shoot and hope that you hit, hit a target. In the 1980s, we start to see a sophistication in the guidance systems that are actually working off of, say, heat signatures around movement signatures and things like this. The guidance systems, and in particular, the ability for these man pads to have uh, quite sophisticated algorithmic decision making to be able to identify pattern and detail some man pads have over uh, say 4,000 sensors, you know, that they're looking at in relation to what, what an adversary is trying to target. Despite international concerns about the risks of man pads being sold on the black market, these weapons have proliferated in recent wars, such as Iraq and Afghanistan, and now in Ukraine. Models such as the US-made Stinger missile have proved fundamental in Ukraine's air defences against low-level aircraft. The successful air denial system that the Ukrainians have put in place have left the Russians struggling to operate in that environment. Russian forces have had to resort to different tactics. They've had to change the way they use their airspace. As the skies have become more dangerous due to advanced surface-to-air missile technology, we've seen the development of new systems to resist air dominance. Countries like Iran, Israel and Turkey have invested heavily in developing new surveillance and combat drones. Drones are proliferating really, um, really quickly uh, across the international system. Um, we can see that because obviously in the case of Afghanistan in particular, but also um, used in the so-called uh, war on terror, the interesting thing about them also is that they can be made extremely cheap. From early in the war, we saw Ukraine not only effectively using the Turkish-made Bayraktar TB2 drone to destroy expensive Russian military assets, but even strapping bombs to commercial drones. And in the past few months, we've seen Russian drone strikes causing vast amounts of damage across Ukraine. Those unmanned vehicles, for instance, as we've seen, like the, the Shahid um, suicide bombing drones, for instance, is an example of how the Russians have had to operate as the airspace has been denied to them. And so what you do is you flood the airspace, almost like a denial of service attack, as we see in, in, on the internet. As you attack a server, for instance, by having so many pings against it, it essentially such shuts down the server. And what we see in the case of Russia is that it's doing the same thing. It's trying to flood the air defense systems. Recent drone strikes against Ukrainian cities have been successful at hitting core infrastructure, particularly energy plants, making life for civilians in these cities extremely difficult. The relatively low cost of these drones is one of the main reasons for Russia to deploy them and in such numbers. Each drone reportedly costs around $20,000, and so losing an expensive advanced guided missile to these drones is not an ideal strategy for Ukraine. Time will now tell if Russia's resources are sufficient to continue this campaign or if another strategy will again form.